This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Well, good morning, gang. Welcome to Let's Get Growing and Let's Get Sweating. I understand that today is going to be a mighty warm day, but that's all right. It's still going to be a great day, especially in the early hours of the morning here. Well, it's 9 o'clock, mid-morning. <laughs> these, uh, these cool hours, it's really nice outside. So let's get outside and get growing. I don't mean to start off with a depressing uh, morning here, but I have spent a good bit of time... Um, at the hospital this week because both my grandmothers uh, were admitted this week and um, it's always a, a sad thing uh, to have to deal with sickness and ailments but we are thankful and thank the Lord that there are people who are out there studying how the body works just like we study how plants work and they're able to fix plants I hope that I can help you fix your plants if you have problems um, but while I was down there at the uh, at the hospital uh, at the Northeast Georgia Medical Center I noticed they had these beautiful gardens these beautiful gardens on the North Tower, and you can meander through and wander through, and you feel, even though you're right there near a parking lot and the parking deck and the building itself, you can meander through these gardens and see beautiful plants, and many of them are tagged and labeled, and we love to see that when we go to a garden, because that way you know what it is you're looking at, and you can find that plant. So this morning, uh, if you you have a little sick plant in your landscape, give me a call. If your plant's not looking so good, let's see what's happening, or if you uh, just have a question about what's going on going on, uh, give us a call at 706-865-3181, or you can uh, send us a, an email at info at wrwh.com. So let's hear from you. And right now on the phone, we have our Farmer's Market Report with uh, Gordon Benson. How are you this morning, Gordon? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, we're doing great. How do things look down there at Freedom Park this morning? Well, i tell you what, I haven't been at the market the last Two weeks and today I was very much um, um, optimistic about the, the, the increase in the number of vegetables we had. Awesome. You might be aware that we had a very slow start to the growing season. You know, plants need water, but they also need sun and they need pollinators. And I think we had sure. some problems with that early on. But today we had uh, tomatoes, corn, we had watermelon, beans, zucchini. Um, hot peppers, okra, blueberries, a whole variety of things, um, and, uh, and, and 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 a good bit of it. You know, good not not as much as in past years, but we've had a we, we had a pretty good supply today. We are selling out over here, so Ooh. if anybody wants to come, some of the vendors are getting pretty low. So you might so want to get up. on over here if you got to, if you want some stuff. You know. Yeah, and uh, what types of items? You mentioned the vegetables, but uh, I understand is is the bread lady there this morning? I don't think she was the earlier. Bre- yeah, they are here. The bread lady uh, is here. Uh, they came in. They're also getting low. We have a nice crowd out. Uh, it's a beautiful day, so a lot of people are coming out to the market. Uh, and we have some, you know, big preserves. And the, the uh, goat lady is here with her soaps and, and lotions. Um, we have begonias. We have the, uh, a quilter that's here selling mm. quilts. Uh, just a wide range, range of different products for sale. Well, that's great because anytime we can get together as a community and uh, show off the whether it's the fresh produce we've uh, grown or whether it's the handcrafted items, the the jams and jellies and honeys and and even fresh baked goodies like from the bread lady, that's a great opportunity. So uh, tell folks how you how they can find the market this morning. Well, if you go to the the old courthouse in Cleveland, we are in Freedom Park, which is just to the east of that park on 115. It's just, a, you know, you can see it from the courthouse square there. Uh, you can also, if you're coming from the south, you can turn. Uh, we've got signs marking it. Uh, but the actual address where the vendors are parked is on Quillian Street, which is right by the Methodist Church in downtown Cleveland. All right, perfect. Well, we appreciate it, Gordon. Thanks for uh, calling in this morning. And give us that farmer's market report. And, um, hey, maybe maybe if you uh, get out there this morning, there'll still be some vegetables left. Well, appreciate you. Appreciate you Let me uh, share this with everybody this morning, and you have a good weekend. Yeah, absolutely, Gordon. Take care. You heard it, folks. There is the farmer's market, of course, this Saturday, this morning, right now, going on at Freedom Park in Cleveland, Georgia. You know, if you've been uh, listening uh, to the program, 
I hope you're listening um, on the radio, 93.9 or 1350 AM. But there's other ways to listen as well. Uh, if maybe you have a friend or a neighbor, well, maybe not a neighbor, I don't know, someone who, who can't reach uh, the station, maybe they're out of town, or maybe you're away on vacation, there's other ways to listen uh, to the program here at Let's Get Growing. Of course, you can listen on the webpage at wrwh.com. It's just that easy. You can listen live right there on your computer or even on your smartphone. But let's take it one step further. Uh, and I've got our producer here, Buster. I want him to tell us a little bit. There's another way you can listen, and it's called the TuneIn app. How does that work, Buster? All right. The... Let me get my mic cut on. <laughs> the TuneIn app is uh, an app that is available in the Google Play and iOS store. You uh, download it onto your smartphone. You can search by uh, call letters or 93.9 FM, AM 1350, and you just see WRWH right there. You add that to your uh, list of favorite stations, and you can listen to us anywhere where you have cell phone service or Wi-Fi. No questions asked. So if you're on vacation, it's a great way to It's check a great in. way to hear my droning voice <laughs> anywhere in the world. That's right. Well, yeah, Buster's right. It's very easy. I did it myself because I live just a little outside of the range. Uh, but well, you can definitely listen on the TuneIn app. So again, listen at 93.9 FM or 1350 AM, WRWH.com, or on the TuneIn app on your smartphone. And let me just throw this in here. If you ever miss a program, just subscribe to our YouTube channel, WRWH. WH Radio, and we've got a backlog of all past programs on there. So if you really want to hear our droning voices throughout the week even more, you, you can could, check us you out. You could even YouTube. listen to this program by noon today. Mm, all up right. On WRWH YouTube channel. The YouTube channel. So, folks, there are ways to continue to listen except just the nine o'clock hour. But if you'd like to give us a call, we're here to answer your questions. Give us a call at 706 865 3181 or what you can do is email us at info at wrwh.com. You've got mail. Okay, so that's uh, definitely one way to reach us is by getting our mailbox full of good gardening questions. Katie, she lives in uh, Salty Nakuchi. She says, I realize this may ultimately be a losing battle, but my backyard is overrun with kudzu. What can I do to get rid of it? Well, Katie, I know it sounds like a battle, and it's going to be a battle. It may be an all-out war, that's for sure, because kudzu is considered an invasive species. It was brought over here as erosion control in the 1800s um, after the years of cotton had just kind of stripped the land and erosion was occurring. The soil was just washing downwards, down, 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 and we got reels and ruts and all these issues. But they quickly found out that it is not very, it's good for erosion, but it climbs trees, and of course, as you notice, Katie, it's all over your landscape. So, it is a war. Here's what we're going to do, though. In order to take care of this problem, in order to take care of the kudzu problem, you've got to stay on top of it. You can, if it's really th- uh, thick, you can try to get in there and cut it back some, um, but most likely you don't have the right machinery to do that. If you're on a farm, it'd be a little easier. But uh, in the home landscape, chemical sprays are going to be one of the, the best options here. And we're going to talk about a product here called Cleanup. Cleanup is a bonide product, which we sell at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. And the active ingredient there is glyphosate. It's 41% glyphosate. And uh, details don't really matter there. What it means is it's going to kill anything that, that it touches. Now, in addition to the glyphosate, one thing we want to do is add a surfactant to that. So after we uh, dilute the chemical... We're going to drop in a couple of uh, uh, drops of uh, Dawn dish soap, which actually helps to adhere the chemical onto the foliage of the plant. And as that uh, chemical begins to work and the plant pulls it in, one issue, uh, I mean, what, what happens is the plant will actually not be able to photosynthesize and make chloroplast. Uh, I'm not going into that. It won't be able to basically produce food for itself, and it slowly kills itself through that chemical. So what you have to do, though, is keep an eye out on it because you want to go in there and spot spray anything else that comes up. Anytime that kudzu, the top dies back, but the roots are still a bit strong, and they're going to try to regrow. Now, if they regrow again and again, we just keep on it with that glyphosate one after the other. Now, keep in mind, though, that that glyphosate, will kill anything it touches so I wouldn't spray it too closely to any of your favorite plants or any of the plants that you actually like but any plant you don't like such as kudzu 
absolutely, let's spray it and use it. But you got to stay on top of it. It may take two to three years in order to completely eradicate it. But with persistence, determination, and a hatred for kudzu, I think that you'll be successful. So I appreciate that, Katie. Thanks for calling. Hope that helps. If not, give us a call back at 706-865-3181. Or you can email us at info at wrwh. Dot com. So let's continue to talk about gardening, all things You've gardening. Oh, and they were going fast this morning. Okay, Diane from Oakwood. Uh, she must. She sent this in. Must be one of our good uh, friends down there south of Gainesville. She says um, that she can. She asked, "Can I cut back the brown flowers on my Shasta daisy?" Okay, so I see you've enjoyed, Diane, that beautiful Shasta flower, which is a white blossom with a deep yellow center. And they're just covering the plant this time of year. They're beautiful. But you're exactly right. Those brown flowers, they start to fade, and the white doesn't look so good anymore. The white and the yellow, it just turns to this nasty brown mush, and it leaves that beautiful plant looking pretty sad. But that's okay because you can cut them back, and you should cut them back. What we call this is called deadheading. And, ladies, I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talking about going out there and removing the deadheads, meaning the flowers that are already spent, removing them from the plant, and... And what happens then is the plant will try to stimulate more growth and though and thus more flower heads. So by doing that, you'll actually encourage that plant to continue blooming. Because see, folks, the whole purpose of a plant's life is to produce seed, to reproduce itself. And once it starts to make seed, it'll stop uh, producing flowers because it knows, hey, I'm done. I've, I've done what I need to do. I need to produce seeds. So you want to remove those dead uh, dead flowers, which lead into seed heads, and, and so that the plant will say, oh, I need to produce more. I need to make more. And you'll just continue, uh, Diane, to get those beautiful flowers one after the other. Okay, Diane, go out there and deadhead. Get a nice sharp knife or pruning shears, or you may with uh, Shasta, even a pair of scissors may work, and you can get rid of that. Folks, We are going to take a little break from all this growing, but we'll be right back and you can give us a call at 706-865-3181 or or, uh, send us an email at info at wrwh.com. While you get your questions up, I'm going to kind of de-tie my, untie my tangled up tongue. We'll see you in a few minutes. Proud to be live and local. Just in touch with what's going on. 93.9 FM. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Let's get growing, folks. It is time to get out there and get dirt under your fingernails. What are you waiting for? Get out of the bed, finish your coffee, and let's get out there and start planting something or start designing something, getting our uh, landscapes beautiful and just gorgeous. Let's talk a little bit about you calling me at 706-865-3181. Or you can email us at info at wrwh.com. Folks, I meant to mention earlier and failed to because we had so much fun uh, with Gordon at the farmer's market in Cleveland uh, that they're uh, coming up in the show in the next half hour or so is going to be, of course, Ethel's Southern Garden Soliloquy, which I hope you'll enjoy. She, of course, is a nice old lady who is glad to share her garden knowledge um, with her soliloquies. Now, um, another segment we have is going to be the plant of the week. And you got to hang around for that because you never know what plant we're going to be talking about and how much beauty it will bring you uh, in your landscape. And Generally, we talk about plants, uh, plant of the week, that uh, are great for pollinators, not just for beauty, but also have some kind of function in the landscape and something like that. So give us a call at 706-865-3181, and we'll take your call. All right, let's go to our uh, email, info at wrwh.com, and we've got Danny who writes here. He's from Gainesville. He says, is there an organic herbicide to kill weeds? Good question, Danny. That is a good question because a lot of folks uh, are trying to go less chemical route and do things more organically, do things that, uh, you know, more like nature may do. Well, with weeds, it is a little tough. It is a little tough because um, there's very few... 
let me back up. The way that weeds are controlled in the na- in the wild is that there are no weeds. They're just plants. Uh, they only become a plant only becomes a weed when we call it a weed because it's in the wrong place or because it's not one that we like or prefer. So, but there are some things that you can do um, that are organic. And let's start off with uh, some bonide products here. The first bonide product that I would refer to you is called Burnout. Burnout is made up of organic oils, oils from plants uh, that actually have a strong effect on weeds. And once you apply that oil onto the, the leaf, it just burns it out. And in a few hours, I'm not talking days, so I'm talking in hours, uh, the top of that plant will be dead. Now, another plant uh, killer you may use that is um, organic is called Bonides Weed Beater Iron. That's Weed Beater F-E. The F-E means iron. So, Bonide Weed Beater Iron, and it's basically chelated iron, which kills the plant we found this very recent uh, uh, technology that we found that chelated iron not just iron because plants do use iron but a special type of iron called chelated iron will actually burn those leaves and and destroy the plant now and that will also occur within just a few hours now danny if you're looking for a, a weed preventer uh, basically a pre-emergent there is a product on the market and bonide sells it it's called maize weed preventer maize is the word for corn and this is a corn gluten product it, you actually apply it onto your lawn it'll help suppress weeds and keep weeds down and keep them at bay so that uh, the weed seed actually never gets to germinate and so you may not in that case have a much of a weed problem at all if you start off with this a pre-emergent again that's called bonides maize weed preventer that's a great question danny we appreciate you emailing us and you can uh, email your question to us as well that uh address is info at wrwh.com or we'd love to hear your uh wonderful flowering voice this morning at 706-865-3181 if you're just joining us i want to remind you to hang Hang on tight um, because Ethel's Southern Garden Soliloquy will be coming up after the half hour as well as the plant of the week. Listen, I know that uh, this time of year it's hot and this time of year we may not want to be outside as much. But the reality is, is this is when plants are actively growing. This is when your garden is doing its best. Well, as long as we have rain or water right (laughs) but the reality is is summertime is growing time and yes like i mentioned we get out there we get hot we get sweaty we get sticky but still there's plenty of things to do and one thing that we always get a question at the nursery is can i plant this time of year well the question is the answer is yes you can is it the best time to plant? Not exactly. Um, is it? Can you transplant this time of year? No, not not at all. Uh, we would not recommend that. The best time to plant is in the fall. But uh, at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, uh, where you can find me throughout the week, not just here uh, on the radio on the weekend, but we do sell containerized plants. Now, what does that mean? That means that our plants come in a container. And when you purchase a containerized plant, you're purchasing the entire root system. That means there's been no damage to the root system. The uh, roots are fully intact, fully involved, ready to just start growing. And so you're not putting a plant under stress as you would if you were moving it out of the ground from one place to another. Some larger nurseries uh, that grow large trees, they dig, they grow them in the ground and dig them. And, and all that work needs to be done in the fall. But be very sure that when you plant a plant that's in a container, you know, the black plastic pots, when you plant one of those, you can plant it this time of year, no problem. The only concern is going to be, can you water it? I had an individual come in and say, I want to do a brand new landscape and we're going to be on vacation for six weeks. And I said, well, you don't want to do it now because if you're not going to be there for six weeks, those plants are going to come back from vacation, had a great time at the beach, had a great time in the mountains, and those plants are going to be nice and crispy. So if you can water your plants throughout the summer, you can plant them now, no problem at all. It's uh, just fine because the plant's going to be growing, uh, but you do have to make sure that we keep keep the water on. And with that in mind... Let's get out there. Let's get growing. Give me a call at 706-865-3181 or email me at info at wrwh.com. You've got mail. Okay. 
we get the mailbox going here pretty strong. That's wonderful. That's okay if we're a little shy. We'll still answer your question as long as it's uh, typed in English because I can't read any other language. But Celeste from Dahlonega says, let's see, my fig crop was most disappointing this year. Oh, that's a shame. Every fig I picked was sour. Why did this happen? Okay, Celeste, let's see. Uh, it's funny you're, that you're calling because I know of a great fig plant that is actually your name, Celeste. So I, I don't know if that's the one you have or not because I'm sure you're sweet and not sour, Celeste. But the, the, with figs, <clears throat> figs are an interesting plant. Let's talk a little bit about them in general and then we'll just figure out maybe why they're getting sour. But uh, figs are great. So they're really a Mediterranean plant. Uh, if, if you went any further north uh, than where we are, you would have to really protect your pl- your fig plants uh, throughout the winter time. There's certain ways that uh, people in the north cover and protect and mulch and all of these things throughout the winter time. But luckily here in uh, North Georgia, we may see some winter damage, but it's not enough to say, oh, we've got to really protect this plant because they're very hardy uh, where, where we are here in Zone 7. But with that being said, uh, this time of year, you'll notice that the the figs, um, the figs produce a flower, which really you never see the flower because the, the inside of what looks like the baby fig is where the flowers are hidden. If you look in the bottom of the fig, uh, little baby fig, when it's little tiny and green, you'll see this little hole and little flies and little things crawl up in there and they get some nectar and they're pollinating the figs. I, I hope that you're getting plenty of pollination um, on your fig plant, Celeste, because that, that could be definitely a problem. Um, if they're not becoming pollinated, they may just drop off and you think, oh, I can eat it now. But no, it's never was pollinated and it's just on its way down. Um, maybe your um, fertilization program. If you haven't been fertilizing, not that they need a whole lot of fertilizer, but figs are very productive, highly productive. And I would say let's encourage some, um, pr- pr- uh, some, some fertilizer because you do want nice, healthy fruits, large juicy fruits and another thing that uh, you may want to consider is making sure that that uh, each fig you you harvest is actually ripe uh, you're going to notice that not maybe a color change there are some green figs out there which makes it even tougher but most figs are going to turn into a darker um, color or maybe in the blacks or browns or purples and so that is one key indicator but also the feel you do want to feel the fruits before you harvest it and see how see if they're soft if they're still a little hard not quite ready and they definitely are going to taste um, pretty sour however if you um, gently just tug at the fruits and it releases itself uh, if it releases itself pretty cleanly and easily then you're going to find that it's it should be ripened it's ready to fall off the tree it didn't take much effort or force and that would be a really sweet should be a really sweet plant so i think you're doing okay i think you're doing everything right uh, assuming that you're treating it normally you're you're making sure that it has plenty of fertilization you're mulching it um, but sour generally uh, that sour taste would come from an unripened uh, fruit. So I would say let those babies sit on the tree just a little bit longer, and I think you will find that your figs will be even sweeter. Let's uh, give us a call this morning at 706 865 3181, or you can email us info at wrwh.com. Hang on tight, folks. We're going into a break, but Ethel will be bringing her Southern Garden soliloquy, and you will hear my plant of the week in the next half hour. Let's get growing. Proud to be live and local. Just in touch with what's going on. 93.9 FM. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Welcome back, folks. We are growing here in the studio. I don't know. I growing minute by minute, right? Give us a call at 706-865-3181. Or uh, if you'd rather email us, you can email us at info at wrwh. Dot com. And now it's time for a garden soliloquy with Ethel, because when life throws her cow patties, she grows a garden. Dear neighbor, with the absolutely gorgeous lawn, thank you so much for keeping your lawn looking so wonderful and rubbing it in my face. Your weed-free, well-edged emerald carpet makes my lawn look like... Uh, uh, 
Thank you for keeping your lawn weeded and feeded and mowed and watered and dethatched and edged and... (laughs) Well, I think you get the point. You've spent so much time and money on your lawn that you could have fed a tribe of starving natives in the African jungles by now. But that's okay. I'm sure the starving natives would appreciate your beautiful grass if they could see it. (laughs) By the way, your keep off the grass signs are wonderful. Little do you know, my precious Pomeranian Sparkles doesn't know how to read. So thanks so much for making such a comfy area for his relief. Also, I appreciate that you keep your lawn cleanly cut to exactly one and three quarters of an inch and for mowing at six o'clock in the morning. Every morning. Every single morning. Thanks. Oh, I just love these summer days, neighbor. My idea of the perfect summer day is when the sun is shining, the breeze is blowing, the birds are singing, and your lawnmower is broken. You know something, neighbor? My last husband was a lot like your lawnmower. He was difficult to get started, and then he didn't work half the time. But in regards to your request of using my lawnmower, of course you can, sweetheart, just as long as it never leaves my garden. <laughs> Oh, but don't worry about my lawn, neighbor, because come winter time, when the snow falls, guess what? Our lawns will look exactly alike. <laughs> Happy mowing. Best wishes, Ethel. All right. Thanks, Ethel, for your garden soliloquy. I kind of agree with Ethel about lawns. I'm not a big fan of them, mainly because I sell plants and not grass. But secondly, because lawns are a lot of work. You know, we have a lot of folks that come into the nursery and they say, I want a landscape that is maintenance free. And then they tell me that they have, you know, 7,500 square feet of lawn. I'm thinking, oh boy, that is your biggest maintenance nightmare right there. I mean, you really do have to baby those lawns. I always call lawn the infant, the baby that never grows up. You're always weeding and feeding, changing its diaper, burping it, all of these things, uh, season after season, and it never stops. And this time of year, it's even more so because we kick in diseases and we also have the mowing issue and the watering issue lawns take a lot of work but if you have a problem with your lawn feel free to call me i'll be glad to help you out at 706-865-3181 or you can send it to our email box at info at wrwh.com i want to remind you to stick around because shortly shortly we are going to be to, uh, hearing about our plant of the week and i think you're going to love it i think you're going to love it but let Let's uh, hear from you, 706-865-3181, and we have a caller on the line this morning. Kim is here with a question. Uh, Kim, how are you? I hear you have a problem with your roses. Yeah, I put out new rose bushes this year, and they were so pretty, mm. but now they, they don't look good. I mean, they're just, they're getting covered in spots. They just uh. look bad they look bad what, what's going on with them okay well that sounds pretty classic now um so some some of these new roses have disease resistance some of these new roses we're getting on the market are disease resistant but it doesn't mean that they're completely free of disease problems and it sounds like you have some black spot going on and that can lead to the overall health of the plant looking pretty bad so black spot is a very common disease in roses and don't worry it's not going to to uh, kill the rose per se but it is a good idea to go ahead and get a control on it just to make it look good because what's the point of having a rose if it's not beautiful right so here's what we're looking at Bonide has a number of products that you can use and that we sell at Lanier Nursery and Gardens to control this black spot problem and to keep your roses healthy. One of the uh, the best controls that Bonide has is called uh, the Systemic Drench. Now, Systemic Drench is going to be a product that you actually pour onto the roots of the plant around the base. So you mix it in a watering can and feed it at the root level. And then the plant just miraculously brings it up into its body and every root, every shoot, every stem every blossom is protected not just against diseases but also against insects so if you've seen some japanese beetles out there this will take care of them as well now another
another issue, now if you just want to spray something on there uh, onto the leaves instead of feeding it at the root level, Bonide has a product called Funganil. And Funganil is going to be a product you spray onto the leaves. It controls uh, not just diseases on roses, but you can use it in the vegetable garden as well. So if you see powdery mildew, if you see uh, downy mildew or some of the spots that pop up on your tomatoes, you can also use Funganil uh, from Bonide on that um, on those plants as well. Now, lastly, if you're saying, well, I really want to try something organic, well, Bonide has a, a, a great product for you that we sell at the nursery. It's called Rose RX, like prescription, Rose RX 3-in-1. And it's a 3-in-1 because not only is it organic and it's a spray for the leaves, but it kills insects, it kills fungus, and it kills mites. So it's an insecticide, a fungicide, and a miticide, which is a really cool word. But, so there's three good products, so come down to the nursery, see me, and uh, we'll be glad to take uh, take a look at your roses. Uh, does that help some? Yeah, that, that sounds good. And, and, have- and you can always, I don't mean to butt in there, but you can always uh, prune your roses back a little bit this time of year, especially oh, okay. as the, the, uh, the flowers are faded. But one thing I would do uh, to prevent spreading that disease would be to, to sterilize your shears. You could either dip them in uh, al- like rubbing alcohol or maybe a little water bleach solution. And every time you make a cut, uh, just clean those shears, sterilize them, and, and that will prevent you passing uh, the, the problem along. So. Wow. Okay. So it's okay to cut off the part that looks so bad. Yeah, if they're looking bad and declining, you can go ahead and cut it off. And any time we prune, which is okay this time of year, I would go ahead and apply some fertilizer as well. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, All thank right. you. Well, thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Kim, for calling in. We'll hopefully you'll uh, continue to listen to us and hang on for that uh, plant of the week, which is coming up. Um, but give us a call, folks, at 706-865-3181. And we've got a caller on the line. This is Floyd. Hey, Floyd, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Nathan. How are you? Great, great. Uh, let's see. Hey, Nate, uh, not Nathan. Floyd, can you cut your mic or your radio in the background? Can you cut it down? Yeah. So I, well, we can we can hear ourselves talking two times there. <laughs> okay. How are you, Floyd? It's been a while since I've seen you. Yeah, uh, I'm doing fine. Good. And, uh, my trees are doing good. Wonderful. I don't know if I've been watering them too much or too little mm. because we'll have just a little bit of a shower, and I don't know yeah. if that's going to be enough or not. Right. And so uh, sometimes will, sometimes won't. And everything's looking real good except my little dogwood. Mm. And uh, its leaves are drooping down and looks like that it needs water. Mm. Uh, that's what I think it looks like. But I felt... You know, down in the roots, like you had told me to, and uh, it seemed plenty moist to me. Yeah. So you're right, Floyd. Um, so, folks out there, uh, Floyd was a good, he's a good customer of mine, and he uh, lives here in Cleveland. And I'm not going to tell you where he lives, but uh, he bought some a lot of trees from us this year, and and he knew that you know this time of year is kind of tough with with moisture. And but he, he's got a question here that is pretty common it does sound like if it feels moist and they're drooping that can still be a sign that there's probably a good bit of water there actually maybe too much down there in the base floyd kind of uh in the planting hole and so i don't think you need to be applying any more uh moisture because drooping or wilting can mean well really one of three things or a combination could mean that there's not enough water which you've already checked for because you said you felt down at the base and it's moist uh the second thing would be that uh, there's too much water. And if it's moist at the top, then it is going to be even moister down at the bottom. And then thirdly, it could mean that there's some kind of animal coming in and chewing on the roots. Um, that's generally not the case, but it can be for sure. And so what I would recommend, um, Floyd, is maybe just to pull, just for the next few weeks or so, pull some of your mulch back, because I know you had some mulch out there, and if you pull that mulch back some, let that um, soil kind of dry out a little bit. Uh, You don't want the plant setting in water, and it sounds like it may be uh, sitting there, at least at the base, in a good bit of water there, Um, but that would be a classic sign for drooping, would be uh, over water, and I actually had planted one um, at the nursery, a dogwood, and It was looking great and fine, and then we irrigated that area, and we were watering our container plants every day, and so uh, 
that one, that uh, dogwood started to droop, just like you mentioned. And I went over there and pulled it out of its hole. And sure enough, it was sitting in a puddle of water. So that was a case where, you know, our irrigation was a problem for that plant, but we had to have it for our containerized plants. And so that would be the one, Floyd, I would really keep my eyes on in the next couple of weeks is uh, it seems like the others aren't, aren't sitting in water, but this one may be just that soil around it may be holding more water than the rest of the landscape, which is very possible. And uh, you, you don't want to keep adding water if it's, if it's drooping. So I'm glad you called in about this because that is, can be a big problem in the landscape is overwatering and causing plants to actually just sit there in a bowl of water. So uh, Floyd, just pull back that mulch for the next few days or so. Uh, hopefully we'll kind of dry it out a little bit and keep a close watch on it and feeling of that moisture, just monitoring that soil. If it gets too dry, that's, that's one thing. But if it dries back out a little bit, um, then that plant should just perk right back up. How about that? Okay. Well, also, I forgot to mention that uh, some of the leaves on the top are turning sort of brown and orange. Mm, an orange. Uh -huh. Okay. So it does seem like it is under some stress there with probably that water. So that browning um, could be that, uh, that moisture because that's what happened to that dogwood that I was talking about earlier that was sitting in water was that it kind of creates this wet look. Um, and it can turn into like a gray and into a brown as it finally uh, moves water moves water out of the leaf because it's just struggled so much, and so I think that uh, that is just really an effect of what is happening with the roots there. So you're you're seeing the effects of waterlogged soil basically. Like right at this moment, oh, those man. waterlogged roots, you know. Okay. And so let's keep a close eye on it, a close watch. Um, I know you fertilized when they uh, were planted there, so that's not a concern. That should help boost the plant, if anything. But we do want to see if we can uh, get those root systems dried out. Um, the last resort, Floyd, would be to extract it from the ground and put it back into a pot um, to, and check on the soil and then replant it essentially um, to see if that soil is holding too much water or maybe we just watered a little too much, which like I said, from one area to the other, you can definitely uh, see a big difference in the soil. So the last resort would be to remove the plant and put it back in its pot for a few days, um, but I would move that soil, uh, that uh, mulch back and just let things kind of dry out a little bit uh, before re uh, reapplying the mulch. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Nate. Yes, sir. It's great to hear you again, Floyd. We appreciate that call. And if you, like Floyd, have a problem in the landscape, and that was a good problem because sometimes underwatering kills plants, but overwatering kills them just as much. But uh, give us a call at 706-865-3181. And we go back to the lines. Oh, here is Charlotte this morning. She has some blueberry bushes, and they haven't produced. And she's asking, why? Charlotte, what's going on with your blueberries? Um, don't really know. They just <clears throat> haven't produced any blueberries, and I was wondering what I might could do to try to get them to that. produce. Okay, so now, um, <laughs> do you know how old about how old the blueberry bushes are? How long they've been planted there? Uh, probably a couple of years. A couple of years. Okay. Now, um, one thing is uh, for production. There's a few things we can talk about here for fruit production. First of all, blueberries do need um, multiple varieties. So if you go into the plant nursery and you buy some unmarked um, plants or maybe they were all the same variety or maybe they only had one variety, or you go to the box store. Box stores are notorious because they don't really care. But uh, if you go there and you buy the same varieties, uh, you won't have good uh, po um, fruit set because the plants do need to have some cross-pollination from different varieties. So oh, okay. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, if, I don't know, that that could be a possibility here is that you have m the same varieties and you may go in there and just buy one or two more plants and then, of course, um, set them out this year. So next year you have a little more pollen going around. That would be the very first thing I think of with blueberries. Now, a second thing would be pollination. Do the plants actually get pollinated? Now, you know those beautiful white flowers that hang off of the blueberry plants in the spring. Mm -hmm. They're gorgeous. They're cute little bells. 
and they actually um, have to be pollinated by a pollinator. Um, so normally what you'll find on blueberries is you'll find bumblebees pollinate them because bumblebees love to get down deep inside of a plant. Honeybees don't really go down deep into the side of these deep flowers, but this is a very deep flower, and bumblebees will get their little heads in there. They just go crazy in there. And so if there was poor pollination, I may uh, recommend to, you know, plant some uh, flowering plants, um, especially like the plant of the week, which is coming up in the next segment. But you could plant some perennials, some beautiful um, native plants that will attract pollinators to coax uh, your berries to come and, and get pollinated. So those would be the two things that I would uh, say as to why the blueberries aren't producing is, number one, uh, they may not have enough pollen. You, I mean, you need uh, multiple varieties to get good cross mm-hmm. pollination and secondly we need some pollinators to actually get out there we've had a pretty wet year kind of an unusual year and that could uh disturb some pollination but i, I really don't think that's the case uh, i think one of the other two may be so does that help out okay. some charlotte that sounds good i'll try that great well thanks for calling in folks we got to go to break but give us a call at 706-865-3181 and up next is going to be our plan of the week so hang around and hopefully we'll answer more of your sticky garden questions proud to be live and local just in touch with what's going on 93.9 fm Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, let's get growing this morning, folks. We've been growing a lot this morning. We've helping folks with uh, um, problems in the landscape. Uh, really, it's just been problems. I, I'd love to hear some success stories. So if you have some success stories from this year, you really feel accomplished and proud of yourself, give me a call at 706-865-3181, or you can uh, email us at info at wrwh.com. Today's plant of the week is brought to you by the Aster family, the largest family of plants on earth. The asters include plants such as sunflowers, chrysanthemums, and dandelions. However, today we are going to talk about one of our most favorite and good-looking asters, Black-Eyed Susan, or formerly known as Rudbeckia. Black-Eyed Susan is a great native plant to the United States, so it attracts a wide variety of native bees, butterflies, including fritillaries and checker spots, and other pollinators. Why should you grow this plant, you ask? Primarily because she's beautiful and really brightens up these sweaty summer days. Black-Eyed Susan is appropriately named because of her strong black center disc flowers that are surrounded by bright golden yellow ray flowers. Of course, the dark center disc flowers are the most precious part of the flower, providing nutritious nectar for adult pollinators to feast on. Also commonly called yellow cone flower, Black-Eyed Susan can grow from one to three foot tall and pretty much blooms all summer and into fall. Even though full sun will encourage the best bloom show, Susie can also tolerate some light shade. She also looks great in a natural or meadow setting in addition to the active perennial border. One excellent selection is known as Goldstrom and was awarded the perennial plant of the year in 1999 and it's still one of the most popular varieties of black-eyed Susans today. Rudbeckia is also very functional. Historically, Native Americans used the root of black-eyed Susan to treat colds, flu, infections, sores, snake bites, swelling, and earaches. It was even used as a diuretic, so be sure to have a few hours available to yourself if you decide to brew up a root tea. Definitely consider the wonders of Black-Eyed Susan at your next visit to Lanier Nursery and Gardens. She will add her wondrous beauty to your garden and won't disappoint your expectations. Again, this week's plan of the week is known as Black-Eyed Susan. Yes, folks, Black Eyed Susan is a great plant. That is my plant of the week for you. And I hope that if you want more information about it, give me a call at 706-865-3181. Time is drawing nigh, but we yet have a few more minutes. Or email us at info at wrwh.com. Now, if you want to keep up with all these little clips that we're giving out, of course, our everyone's favorite neighbor, as Buster says, Ethel, if you want to keep up with her or keep up with our plant of the week, just go to the YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com and WRWH Radio, and there you'll be able to find all of our plants of the weeks that are that have happened and plants that are to come. And, of course, Ethel's soliloquy uh, will be there at, at the uh, WRWH Radio at YouTube.com. So, again, let's keep answering your garden questions. Here off of the line at our mailbox is from Dottie, and she's in Helen. She says, 
When instructions say to plant tulip and daffodil bulbs four inches deep, does that mean four inches of soil should cover the tops of the bulbs or the bottoms of the bulbs? Good question, Dottie, because sometimes the little packages that we buy bulbs in aren't very descriptive. Sometimes they have these archaic little drawings that make it even harder to understand how to do it. So I'm glad you called me so I can help you with this. So what we're going to do is when we plant bulbs, we're going to plant down into the soil um, about four, sometimes six inches. The, the general rule is you don't, you don't have to have um, instructions on the back if you remember this rule here. Depending on how tall any bulb is, say it's an inch tall, you want to plant it two to three times that depth. So if it's two inches tall, uh, it could be planted up to four to six inches. And so if, if you use that rule two to three times the height of the bulb, just get out your little ruler and measure it and see, then multiply by two, two or three. Um, sometimes that's tough for me to do, but if we do that, then that gives you the depth. So you say four inches down, you dig down into the soil, four inches, place the bottom of the bulb there in the soil, and then cover it with four inches of soil. So it is about that depth means digging down into the soil that deep, planting the bulb, and then covering it up with um, that soil that you just removed. So, Dottie, I hope that that helps some. Uh, bulbs, of course, um, certain bulbs you'll be planting pretty soon in the fall, and then others to come in the late spring, uh, like dahlias and things. But daffodils and tulips uh, is about time for that. And uh, I hope that you'll be able to find some bulbs, because they can add a little splash of color. Unfortunately, the, bul the flowers on bulbs generally don't last as long as I hoped, or as I would like, but they do add a beautiful beautiful display when they are in full bloom. So Dottie from Helen, thanks for listening and thanks for emailing us. And you can email us too if you have a question, info at wrwh.com or I'd love to hear your voice this morning at 706-865-3181. 706-865-3181. Now, Oh, look You've here. We have mail. Right here, we have a question about... Straight from the boss. Straight dude. from the boss. Well, I'm going to read it because the boss wrote it. There is a bush. Uh, there's bushes in front of the station. This is right out here at WRWH. One of them looks like it's dying. Is there hope to revive it? Uh, let's see. Dean said he was pretty sure he didn't spray weed killer on it. <laughs> so, uh, we've got the uh, the disclaimer there that it wasn't the boss's fault. You know, I noticed that poor plant there. The, the, the plants that are out here outside the station are, uh, are abelia. Abelia is a great plant and great landscape plant. And if you need a small shrub, it gets about three foot tall or so uh, in your landscape. Uh, it, it's evergreen. It has little white flowers on it in the summer. Um, but I did notice that the one outside is looking pretty sad. And I tried to determine every, t every day I walk into the studio here what might be wrong with it. I have yet to look down into the soil. I may look down into the soil. One thing I noticed is that it's on the end of the row. So there's about... Um, yeah, like four, four or five bushes out there, and the one on the very end is looking pretty sad. It is looking pretty sad, and um, I don't know if it's dried out, if it was too wet. Um, the weed killer, I, I, I would say Dean's probably right. He, it's probably not a weed killer issue, um, but um, regardless, I, I think it may be a soil issue. So on my way out of the studio this morning, I'm going to look down past the mulch and see exactly what's going on down there. So straight from the straight, straight from the station here, we have a gardening question, You've got mail. and we go back to our mailbox and we look for. Let's see, Bonnie. Bonnie's from Town Creek. Bonnie says, our Famosa azaleas failed to bloom. They have been carefully fed, watered, and pruned. What could be wrong with them? Okay. Fed is not a problem. Watered is not a problem, but pruned. I wonder what we mean by carefully pruned there. Um, Bonnie, in Town Creek, I, I want to ask you a question. When did you prune, carefully prune them? Because with azaleas, it's all about timing. Formosa is a wonderful, a wonderful plant uh, that does beautiful in the landscape, beautiful flowers. Great azalea. But they are, they do bloom on old wood, which means if they were pruned in the spring, if they were pruned in the spring, that's a problem. You've just cut the blooms off and they would fail to bloom. So from now on, Bonnie, if you want to do any pruning, uh, save it for right after, after they bloom. 
Um, when you prune an azalea that blooms in the spring, as God intended, <laughs> uh, th- what you want to do is let them bloom and then prune. Oh, that's good, isn't it, Buster? Let them bloom and then prune. It's like a an approximate rhyme. Our first official catchphrase. <laughs> Our first official catchphrase. Let them bloom and then prune. Because watering and feeding is not a problem, but the pruning, I'm afraid, uh, could be a problem with azaleas if they're not pruned at the appropriate time. So thanks, Bonnie, for that. Uh, folks, I know we're drawing close in, and I want to say a few words before we leave. You know, it's, it's hot, we're hot out there. We're sweaty. I even noticed... Someone's out there cutting the grass at the station. That's wonderful. I can't tell. I don't know who it is. I can't see. He's got a great hat on. And that's a wonderful thing because when you're out there, listen, folks, skin cancer is no joke. And ultraviolet rays from the sun for gardeners is going to be tough. Not only does it cause, well, can give you a beautiful, gorgeous farmer's tan like I have, but the problem is we got to protect our skin. We've got to make sure that we don't have any problem with our skin. So wear your hats, wear your lotions, and you'll be good. Now, folks, remember to catch us up on Facebook, to see us there at WRWH on YouTube. You can use the TuneIn app to listen in next week if you're on vacation, but I will be right back here to answer your gardening questions at 93.9 and 1350 AM uh, WRWH with Let's Get Growing, and I want you to keep doing that. Grow, grow, grow because the more uh, that you know, the more you can grow. So, give us a call next week or leave us a message at info at WRWH.com Again, because I messed up, is info at WRWH.com rwh.com and we'll be glad to answer your question next week or give us a call but again until folks until then folks uh let's get growing thanks for joining us for today's let's get growing program with nathan wilson if you have a comment about today's program you can reach out to nathan by sending an email to grow at lanier nursery gardens.com Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350. Local news, sports, and community information.